Yo, on this channel, you guys are used to us doing a lot of tech from the 60s and the 70s. Well, this time around, we're going to do something from the 1860s, the 1870s. We're going to take a look at the steam locomotive, the external combustion engine. And a lot of people don't realize you wouldn't have the internal combustion engine if it wasn't for these things. A lot of the same systems, almost all of the same systems that you work with today on our engines originated here. We're going to go outside and we have another one of these locomotives. We're going to show you how all of this stuff works. But this particular one, this is a truly badass locomotive. This thing was built in 1902. This is actually a twin to one that ran 127.1 miles an hour in 1905. This was like the fastest thing on earth. 127.1 miles an hour in 1905. Riding a bomb is literally, that's what it is. It's a bomb. To make these things make power, you got to push them to that edge. I'll explain that. So, and this one, lays, this is an exact duplicate of the one that ran the 127. The original one was scrapped of all things in like 1939. So they refurbished this one and it's the twin, but all of the same parts are there. Look at the size of these drivers, right? Now I'm standing on the ground, right? You get an idea, I'm 5'10". So let's go outside and let's get a closer look at what makes these things tick. Talk about patina. It's the rat rod of steam locomotive. This one is actually better to illustrate what goes on than one of the restored ones because this one's got the jacketing removed. Usually when you see these, it's got a skin over this part of the locomotive. Originally, that skin, they had asbestos sandwiched between the boiler or the, the main part of the locomotive and that, that sheeting. This has been removed to clean all of that up. Uh, but anyway, Let's describe, let's, it looks like an incredibly complicated piece of machinery, but they're simple, simple, just big. And because it's so big, it's a little hard to film this because like we're used to dealing with engines, you know, here's a cylinder head. And it gets a little bit different here. So, all right, start with the, with the most basic thing of all, the firebox. So this is the area right here where whatever this locomotive is gonna burn, if oil, coal, wood, whatever, whatever it happens to be set up to run on, this is where it's burned. You can tell the difference between what is the firebox and what's the boiler by the difference in the fastener that holds it together, the stay rods and stay bulbs. You see all of these are there to keep the boiler and the firebox together because this is obviously subject to great expansion and also great explosive forces. When these things go off, they've been known to level towns. So this is where everything is burned. The area there with those with the with the nuts, the hex, the hex area, that's the actual boiler. So the firebox is surrounded by water. The water is pumped in from the tender. Or actually, no, some of these are actually tank locomotives and they have a tank surrounding, instead of having the jacketing, the normal jacketing, they have a water tank. But in this particular setup, the water is carried in the tender. It's pumped into the boiler section. So the boiler, like I said, is all of that. And above, above the firebox is what's called a crown sheet. That crown sheet always has to be submerged in water. That's, that's when you reach the danger point with these things. When that crown sheet goes dry, it'll turn red hot and the pressure from the boiler will collapse it into the, you know, not, you're not a happy day if you're driving this thing and that happens. They actually had fusible plugs in, in, in the later years, they put fusible plugs in the top of the firebox so that if the water pump failed or for whatever reason the thing would go dry, if for whatever reason the thing would go dry, the fusible plug would blow through and the water from the boiler would put the fire out rather than have the thing explode. So, from this point forward in the boiler, you've got two fluids that run all the way to the front to this section right here. And that's, here forward is, is the smoke box. So it's basically inside this area here is just the ends of the flues, the piping that goes to the cylinders, and we'll get to that in a second, and then of course the smokestack. So your, your path is from the firebox through the boiler to the smokestack. Okay. So now, that's the external combustion part of it. 
but the way the external combustion relates to the function of the machine is very similar to what you're accustomed to on an internal combustion engine. So, here are the pistons. You got one on this side, there's one on the other side. And the unique thing about a steam piston, a steam locomotive piston, is that it's powered from both sides. So, when the piston is, is here, steam is forced into the chamber, the pistons move back. When the piston gets to this point, steam is forced in and the piston moves back. So this thing is powered both ways. And that's what this thing is here for. This is the valving that coordinates that steam to keep everything moving back and forth. Now on this engine, we're missing the, the, the main connecting rod, the driving rod. It would go from here. So here's the equivalent of, let's say the, the uh, the wrist pin area on, on a regular engine and then from here you have a rod that would come to here and then these connecting rods tie the wheels together same exact concept as you have in an internal combustion engine here's where things really start to get like the, the, the similarities are right there the parallels this particular engine is intended for higher speed travel. So 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. You know this because it has a very tall driving wheel and it has a very short stroke. If this engine, let's say was, uh, and this would be the same as having, let's say uh, a, a 270 gear set or a 220 gear set in your rear end. And this would be the same as having, let's say a three inch stroke inside your engine. High speed. If there's, there's one moving out now. By the way, we're at the Railroad, Pennsylvania, Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, and that's the Strasburg Railroad behind us. And John Wilburn actually has a story about pulling that very locomotive with a wolf. We'll, we'll let him tell you about that on this channel. So the relationship here is exactly the same as what you'd have on a car. Here's your tire diameter and rear gearing, and here's your crankshaft. A smaller engine, like let's say a freight engine, or, or, or even a, that, uh, the, the switcher, a locomotive that's only used to move cars around, will have very short driving wheels and an extremely long stroke. And that's to give it that low speed traction, but no top end. That's if you, if you come back a little bit, we can point out some of the finer details. You know, these engines have a lot of stuff up on the top. So, I mean, some of it is obvious. The headlight, the smoke box, the bell. But that right there, that one there is the throttle. So, there's piping that runs from there through the top of the boiler <coughs> and then meets up with the cylinder here. You'll also see on most, almost all locomotives, you'll see another dome that isn't on this one right now, and it'll be positioned right there. And that's actually, believe it or not, that's to drop sand on the rails to give this thing traction. So here, here's a piping for it. So if you're going to pull out, and this thing is just spinning the wheel, the engineer could pull the lever and let sand come down this tube they come on the rails and that's how they get them going. Uh, it's the reverser. This actually switches this switches the action in the valving section of the of the cylinder. And here are the brakes. Just a nice big brake shift. Very simple, very straightforward. And it's a mechanical linkage that runs along the inside of the chassis and just joins them all together. So these are the brakes for the locomotive. Bearings are kind of unique. These things ride on pillow blocks. There isn't, you know, it doesn't have like a roller bearing type of deal. But if you come here, here's how they used to lubricate these things. The, the grease that they would use was, was a thick heavy tar-like grease and they would just slop it into these boxes and that would keep this kernel loop. This right here, this mess is a wick to help keep the oil on the uh on the journal. 
big, beautiful, fascinating locomotives. The reason we say the one that was inside the only ran 100, 127 miles an hour in a house is, is what happened in 1905. Okay? The reason we say it's like a bomb is because to get the kind of power that you need to, to move that, think about how much air this thing is moving. This is not an aerodynamically uh, sound device. This is like, it's a house, okay? The amount of power that it took to move this thing to go to 127 miles an hour is off the chain. And the way they would do that is they would starve it of water. So they would, they would build up, the, they'd get the steam pressure up, they'd get the thing maxed out as far as it would go, and then they would cut off the water supply and get the crown sheet superheated. Then they would turn the water back on, the steam would go berserk, and then this thing would have the extra oomph to go 127 miles. Look at this thing. So, listen, I've driven a few of Walters. I would get right back on one of those cars and do that before I would even attempt to go 127 in this thing. So, I don't know. Fascinating old stuff, right? This is real machinery. I hope you got something out of that. I certainly did. I'll see you tomorrow. Competition to pull this train, and it was a, a police benefit. They only did it one year, but this thing weighs, I believe, with the tender car, eight hundred and eighty thousand pounds. And we would pull it on the rails. One revolution of the drive wheel. The drive wheel, I believe, is twenty five point four feet in circumference. And we had a rope, and that rope was about that big around. And we chalk up our hands, get our feet dug into those ties good, and we would arrange the guys in order of height, from shortest to tallest. And so, you know, the, the five foot guys in the front and the six and a half foot guys in the back, and I was somewhere in the middle. And I left with a bunch of blisters on my hands, but I think our team, I want to say we finished second. I think we were in the semis that day, but it was a whole lot of fun. And yeah, we pulled this thing with a rope. And hopefully I can find some pictures, because that was a whole lot of cameras ago. But if I can find some pictures, I'll drop them in there for you guys. Yes, that really is me in the pictures. You'll recognize the train, and you don't recognize me. But it was a lot of fun.